start recording. Okay, so let's take a look at this IDA Pro. And I've got, um, I'll start with the slides and then demonstrate it live. I should mention I just wrote two versions of this project. Let me get to the right class, which is 126. And so originally I thought we could use the same project for both the cloud and the local machine, but there were enough differences in the version that I found it handy to get. So I, I left the old project as it is, and the new one I wrote up here, because there are two free versions of IDA. One that's very old that I used on that Windows 2008 machine, and there's a newer one, IDA, free, IDA Pro Free version 7 that I wrote up here. So it's very similar, but the pictures look a little different. So do one or the other. I suppose you could do both, but I wouldn't really bother. Uh, one or the other is good enough to teach you what's worth knowing. So IDA Pro is the professional disassembly tool for static analysis. It is expensive and very complicated, and you um, and the real pros get two high resolution monitors or more and stare at this thing all day long, and they can dig really deeply into operating systems and software. Um, so you have to pay for extra features. The old free version only does x86. The pay feature supports other processors, and to do disassembly, where it will take your assembly code and turn it back into source code, you have to pay for that feature too, so it can easily be $5,000 or more. Although, Gidra, the free NSA disassembler, has now been putting out free Gidra modules to put in IDA, so that might be another option. It might be free alternatives to some of the expensive IDA modules. And they also have the Flirt library, which is, um, related to things forensic tools have, a library that recognizes a lot of common files so it can, it can uh, connect to them easily. So the main thing you do in IDA is look at assembly code in graph mode like this, where it puts the code in boxes and has arrows. So here you'll have a jump not zero, a compare to something and jump not zero, and there's a condition. And if it's true, you follow the green line, and if it's false, you follow the red line. And they seem to think that this is enormously helpful. I guess it's better than this. This is the old fashioned text mode where you just see lines of assembly code. One thing that confused me at first is this actually has only three assembly commands here. Push EBP, move EBP, ESP, and push ECX. All the rest of these have the same byte address, which is impossible. So all this is comments automatically generated by IDA. And for some reason, they feel the need to put addresses in front of the comments, which I find mightily confusing, but you get used to it. So it tries to add a sort of C-type function declaration at the start of a routine to show you what kind of arguments are going in. But that's all synthetically generated by IDA in some attempt to make it easier to read. None of that is, of course, included in the assembly code. So that's the graph mode display. This is, and it has the comments up here. And then it has the assembly code instructions, but it doesn't have the addresses of anything, and it doesn't have the actual bytes that you'll see when you look in the file with a hex editor. So I don't find this very useful, so I always go into options general, and I turn on line prefetches to see the addresses, and I turn the number of opcode bytes up to six. And now I get something that I find more useful. I can see where I am, and I can see what the raw binary bytes are going to be there which is helpful to me because I'm often gonna just look right back into the RAM with a debugger or into the file with a hex editor and I'll want some reference points so I can see what's going on. So we talked about this, red is a jump not taken, green is what's taken, I think if it's true, a blue is an unconditional jump, and you can have an up arrow which indicates a loop. So here we've got a condition, it's compared to something, jump not zero, so if it is in fact not zero, I think you go this way. And if it is, if that condition is false, it goes this way. Then you do either of these two things. And then regardless, you go to this point because the blue lines are unconditional. You can highlight text. And if you do, it will highlight all the matching text. So this might help you find two references that are on the same screen at the same time. And you want to see if they're connected. Um, we talked about this. The address is here. Another thing that should be familiar by now is this is the section. Remember, there's the text section for assembly code and the data section and the hard data section for static data, and there may be other sections. And up here, you have just a sort of uh, place to put the arrows. 
So this is a, under certain conditions, this will jump down here. That's an unconditional jump, so it's a solid line. This is an up arrow jump for some kind of loop, and so on. This is the representation of the arrows in text mode. And these are automatically generated comments that are attempt that Ida has created to try to help you understand the code. All right. And uh, so here, those are auto comments. You can turn them off here if you actually don't want the automatically generated comments, but usually you do want them. So you can add comments. If you, if you, if you or excuse me, if you turn this on, it will automatically add even more comments on every instruction. Things like add to tell you this is an add and logical exclusive or, that's probably not very helpful. Those are a little bit too obvious. I think. Anyway, um, so for analysis, uh, the functions line is quite useful. This will show each function, the length of it, and its flags. Um, so you can find the names of functions. If you're, if you're analyzing something that comes with connections to source code, debugging information, like the Microsoft kernel, then this might be more helpful than it is for malware usually. Uh, names is useful. Every address with a name, like main and start. But I mostly use strings, just because I'm used to simple strings tool like bin text. I'm accustomed to going to strings and looking for some string I can understand, like a message, success, internet connection, and then going there, and I'll know I'll find the interesting part of code. Um, this is a old, old habit that I have from the 80s, from coding long ago. In the early languages, there were no debuggers, so what you did was you put print messages all over the place to mark what you're doing, and then you would orient yourself by those messages. And I still think that way. I'd like to run the code until it prints something, and then disassemble it and go to where it printed that thing, and then I know where I am. There are probably other techniques, but that's the old-fashioned technique that I'm used to. You have imports and exports. Um, these imports are library functions it uses. So this program brings in some stuff from kernel 32 and some stuff from WinINET. And so this is quite logical. These are where you'll see your C library function calls. And then you have exports. And if this is an executable file, it will usually have only one export with a name like start or main, because you're only supposed to enter it at one point. There is not a library that offers many entry points to be used in different ways. Uh, you've got data structures available if you want to see those. And you can hover all through IDA. You can hover over a line, and a yellow box will pop up with more information, which can help orient you. And you have cross-references. You can double-click a function. Uh, you can also press Control-X to open the, the cross-reference window. And it will show you where this thing is used. We'll, we'll play with that live a little better, be more clear in this picture. And so here's a function call. We talked about this before. If you're going to call a function down here, like string length, now to read this, I'm not quite sure why there's an L in front of it, but the W at the end means it runs on wide characters, not ASCII characters, but Unicode characters. Uh, Sam, so the L stands for long, and they're usually pointers. Yeah, so L means that this is a using long pointers. Sorry, correct. Yes, L for long. Okay, thank you. So long pointers and there is instead of short pointers. I assume this is 32-bit code, which is what the L is standing for. So it's a long int, which would be 32, I think. There is a short, oh, gosh, there's a short range pointer. Of, you just, uh, oh, I see what you mean. Yes, there are short jumps and long jumps. Anyway, that's right. This is a call. Okay, so anyway, this is call and call this function. And so when you call a function, you don't just call it. You have to put the arguments on the stack first. So you'll push something and push something else. And those are going to be arguments. Then you go here. So one of these is going to point to the string. And the other is some other parameter of this function. Uh, all right. So that's what you typically see. Uh, you very often get lost in Ida Pro. It is very complicated. You often click on things and end up in some funny window you don't understand. So things like Windows Reset Desktop can help you get back to where you started. Or, of course, the old technique with just a hammer where you just close it and reopen the program again to get back to default. Um, so you can go, you can double click from any of these other windows like strings, and it will show you that string. It'll show you the place where that string is stored. So here I have something called heat alloc, and if I double click it, it will go show me where that is stored on the stack. 
or in the code, in this case, in the text section. Uh, then you can double click any address to show that location. And so that's, that's reasonable. You have forward and back buttons like a browser. So if you click and click and click and end up somewhere crazy, you can go back, back to back to try to get back to the part that, where you understood it. And this thing, I didn't know about for about a year. This is extremely helpful. If you open up a sample of any size, it will actually take Ida quite a while to analyze it, like maybe minutes, because I think it's all doing it with some slocum um, interpreted language like Python, just like debuggers. So it doesn't make any sense until it's ready, and it will show you this bar changing colors. And when it's done, this bar will be filled with colors. And the um, dark blue is the most interesting stuff. The dark blue here is the user written code. The rest of it is things like fixed strings and um, code generated by compilers and such and library functions and things. This is where you're going to find the bugs you want to find if you're trying to analyze errors made by user mode developer, which is the most common situation. So this is one way to find your way back home if you get lost. If you just see a bunch of gibberish on the screen, you can click some dark blue up here, and you're likely to see part of the actual effective part of the program that you want to analyze. You can jump to a location with G, then you can just type in an address and go there, or to any named location. Um, and you can search. You can search for many things. You can search for sequences of bytes, for text, for the next code, for the next data, and so on. Many, many ways to search for things. And everything has keyboard shortcuts because the experts really do spend their, spend their life in this thing and get very fast at using the keyboard. So you've got cross references. If you go to a place where data is stored, they'll find code X reps here showing you where this is referred to elsewhere in the code. And if you hover over the cross reference, a little box will show you the code. And if you double click, it will jump to the display of that assembly code. So if you find some stored data and you want to see the code that uses it, you can do that. And I've talked about this before. Um, click the name and press X will get you to your cross references. I use control X, I think. And so let me uh, bring this stuff up. Now I'm having, I've noticed something a little strange here. Zoom works pretty well, but my, um, Connection to a remote desktop keeps cutting out on me, so I let it close. Let me bring it back up. And I should mention, by the way, in case I haven't in this class, uh, my Windows machine is here, my Google Cloud machine. And notice I still have a lot of money. I'm spending less than $10 a week here because every time I'm done with my Windows machine, I turn it off because this Windows machine is really a hog. I turn it all to the maximum. It's running on an SSD with 60 gigs, and I think it has 16 gigs of RAM and four processors. It's got as much as they would let me have of everything. So I shut it down, and every time I turn it back on, this address changes. The name and password does not change, but that address changes if you leave it down for more than an hour or two. So I have to keep adjusting that in the parameters of my remote desktop client. So I've gotten used to doing that. I just go here and adjust the address to match the current address. Since it's been on for a couple of hours and I haven't turned it off lately, it's still okay. So I can now connect. And because my machine is really highly resourced, it's snappy and the desktop comes up right away. So I've already got Ida open and a project running here. Let me just close Ida and I'll get in from the start here. When you close Ida, you can save the desktop the database, but I don't want to do that. Remember I said you might be analyzing a sample for weeks and you'll be filling it with comments and notes and you really want to keep all that. But for the little simple projects we're doing, I'm not doing that, so it doesn't matter. So I'm going to open, uh, I guess I'll go through the process. I'm disassembling a new file, which means I want to start fresh analyzing a new sample. I'm not picking up from a saved database of what I've been working on before. And so I go to my desktop because I've set this up the way we showed in previous classes with a special malware folder on the desktop that's not being protected by my antivirus. And so in the lab here, I go to chapter five, Dill. This is the project you'll be doing from the book. Ida has some options. I just ignored it and used the default analysis. It took a few seconds. You see it's populated this color bar here. And so, I'm seeing some weird junk here. 
Um, unfortunately, it always just opens with a loader, which I think in this case is the loader that prepares the virtual machine-like environment to run 32-bit code on a 64-bit operating system. But even on a 32-bit operating system, it always starts by showing you uninteresting Microsoft code, not the actual code you want to analyze. Now I could use this bar and just click here and I'd be jumping into the middle of the developer's written code and that might help me. But anyway, I see things that are irritating me. These bar windows on the left are annoying. I don't care about the names of functions right now. And so I can close that. So this is text mode where I'm seeing things uh, as just a long list of instructions. If I press the space bar, I get to graph mode. And here's this graph overview. I'm not sure quite how, what someone thinks this is going to help me do. So I just get rid of that. And now I'm here and I can examine these things. And again, it's difficult to find anything useful. So I'm going to do the thing I usually do. I go to strings to find something I can understand. So I open subview and then strings. And here I will hopefully find something interesting. I've got uh, libraries and so on. All right. Anyway, in this, um, this is the project in the book with a somewhat realistic malware sample. And we're going to look at the get hosts by name. So let me bring up my slides or perhaps the project to show this. Um, double click an interesting string. You can see where the string is used and so on. I'm just going to now take a look at the IDA Pro project. Let's go through some of this. This is the easiest way to see it go. So, um, I'll play with those options a little later. First, I want to find some interesting code. So here's get host by name. I might want to find this Windows API call where it does a DNS resolution. So suppose I'm looking for the command and control center. I have some reason to suspect that this thing uses networks. So I go view, open sub view, and um, imports. And here's all the API calls it makes close key and reg query value. Now, by the way, I wonder if I can make the font bigger because I'm worried about you people seeing it. I may not be able to do that. Let's try options and font is grayed out, unfortunately. General, all right, I think I probably can't. I said, anyway, so to find get host by name, I sorted alphabetically. And it sorts stupidly by ASCII, so the capital G's are totally separate from the lowercase g's, which is the way most of these things work because they're really doing a simple ASCII code. And so here's this thing called get host by name, which is a DNS resolution from WS2 underscore 32, one of the Microsoft main network libraries. If I double click that, it will take me to the data section where it stores the name get host by name. And so if I click it here, it will highlight it. And I do a code cross reference here. So, but I think I can use control X now. Yeah, control X will now show me the cross references to get host by name. And these are all the sections of code that call this function. And the one we want is I think this one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, this one here, 1656 plus 101 is the one of immediate interest to us. So I can double click that. And now I get to the code that calls it, and there's a name up here. And let me go back to my uh, project instructions so I don't fall off the track because it's very easy to get confused. And this one here doesn't look much like the pictures I'm showing you because that's the project for the Windows 2008 machine. Let me go to the new one that will have the pictures for cloud machines here, 303C because they're a little bit different looking. And so once you go to get host by name, you can then find that function. And here you see the code that calls it. And if you go to the offset up here, see it's gonna call get host by name. And I would like to find the name of the host. So here's the code. This is the parameter offset. And if I hover over it, this yellow box shows me something. This is RDO picks dot something. If I double click it, it will take me down to a pointer, which is stored someplace to that 11940. And here's the cross reference. And if I click on the cross reference, 
and it takes me back to there. So I'm going back and forth. Anyway, let me get back to where I was. Um, I've already gotten lost, so I'm going to look for my back button. Back. There we are. This is where I want to be. And um, let's go to hex view here. And now I can see that what I'm looking at now is a pointer, 10, 0, 1, 91, 94. And that's down here, 10, 0, 1, 91, 94 is here. So there's the actual bytes that store this whole string. This is RDO pix.practicalmalwareanalysis.com. So that is the um, command and control center for this malware as a fully qualified domain name. And that's one example how to dig your way through things with Ida Pro. So um, Ida will try to assign names to things that it can if you have, um, the, it has the ability to connect to string symbols. And it has some graphing options. These funny buttons over here, I've never really gotten any good out of them, but you can plot things like function calls and flow charts and such. Um, some of them seem very old. Uh, and cross references too. Some of them are a little interesting. I was able to get the list of main functions in calc.exe, and I was surprised when the Windows calculator calls check Windows genuine status. So apparently there is some module that wants to treat you differently if you've actually paid for your Windows or if it's pirate, although I doubt that actually is implemented. It's the about page, Sam, on the for the calculator. The about page is what calls that function. The about page calls that function. Why? It tells you that you've got a pirate copy of, of Calculator? Apparently. I, I, I remember seeing that too and being quite surprised. Yeah, I'm glad you went into it. Anyway, then you can do cross references here and see check windows, genuine status, and where it goes. Um, so it might be useful. You can make charts. There are various ways to look at them that way. Um, there's no undo. If you, you can start changing your disassembly. Um, this becomes necessary if you get into more advanced stuff because, for one thing, Ida Pro can make mistakes. It's actually guessing how to interpret the code, and also you can put labels in. So be aware. Um, you can rename things. If it doesn't know the name of a function, it will just give it a name like sub 401000, which will just use the address where it starts as a name. So if you think you figure out what it means, you could give it a more friendly name, and Ida will automatically update it everywhere. And that's, of course, what the experts are doing as they figure out what the pieces do. So here you can have a function with unnamed arguments. And it has um, things like variable 598. And on the right, it changes things like port and port string. So if you're careful and these labels are accurate, this will help you. If you're sloppy and you put in labels that are wrong, you'll just dig yourself deeper into a hole. So you can add comments and you can echo comments to all cross-references. Numbers are all put up in hexadecimal, but you can right-click on them to see other things like decimal values if you want to. Um, so if you can use name constants, you could put in the official Microsoft name for Microsoft API calls, and that would be helpful. And you can add plugins, just like Wireshark and Ollie Debug, all these, and Metasploit, all these things are frameworks, and they're connected to a scripting language and the community keeps adding more scripts. And they all seem to choose different languages to do it, but Ida at least uses Python, which would seem like the most normal thing, although it has the unpleasant consequence that a whole generation of hacking tools, including all my projects, is tied to Python 2.7. And they've been yelling at us for years that Python 2.7 is going down, and now they say they're really gonna take it down next year. And if they do, then this whole generation of tools is going to have a problem continuing to run if Python 2.7 becomes difficult to reach. So I'm hoping that the community will continue to rebel and just ignore the recommendations so we can all just keep using Python 2.7 some more. But we'll find out next year what happens. Anyway, I've got a coot to bring up here in one of these other windows. And there they are. This is chapter four five because I'm doing them a little out of order this year. And let's see if it's going to work. Okay. And I think you can all right. I think I'm going to disconnect my headphones so you can hear the gorgeous music. Eh, maybe I won't.
not to do it without music today. I can hear the music, but I don't think you people can. Wow, they still have trick on. Oh my goodness. Somebody's really found the mathematical symbols. OMG, I agree. All right, I'll wait a few more seconds. I guess that's it. Oh, maybe not. Okay. She Ed there, but he might be using another name. Yeah, okay, Carrie. I better wait a few more seconds. People are still coming in. All right. I think maybe I've got everybody now. Okay. All right, so what feature shows the instructions in those little boxes connected by arrows? Okay, that's graph mode. All right. Where do you see user written code as dark blue lines? That's the navigation band. All right. What kind of code can you not disassemble with Ida Pro Free? You can't do x64 code. By the way, Ida can do other things like Linux and Mac and such, but I don't, that's quite limited in the free version. I don't think you get very much of that. All right. How do you get from graph mode to text mode? Okay, that's the space bar, moves you back and forth. All right. And how do you move to a specific hexadecimal address? Okay, G is going to another address, okay. So my winner is Juggernauts. I don't know who that is. They'll have to tell me. M. Hino, I know who that is. And Ken Tan. So Juggernauts is not going to get their points unless they give me a better clue who they are. And um, let me just take a look. Uh, here comes a chat message that might be telling me. Aha. OK, good. OK, that's Ed. So I'll record that. All right. So I got that, and uh, let me just take a look at the project because I should explain a little more about how to do it and maybe even demonstrate more of it. Um, let's go to 126 and projects, and it's this one, 303C. So I showed you the first part where you tracked down the get host by name to get the command and control center. And that gets you the domain name. And OK, this part is the next bit to do. Let's take a look at that one. We're going to go to the command.exe item 
So we'll go to view open subview strings. Now my Microsoft machine lost its connection again, which I mentioned is happening. For some reason, I don't know, but I just have to reconnect when it happens, so it's not too much trouble. And one good thing about it is it remembers what I was doing. Okay, so I had this file open, which is the Labo 501, and I'm going to look at the, um, is it Dills? Let me see. View subview strings. Okay. Open subviews strings is here. All right. And I can sort by typing, clicking here, I can sort them. So here's capital letters. And if I go down, I get symbols like brackets and backslashes. And right here is the one I'm interested in, backslash, backslash, cmd.exe. That's launching a command prompt, and the slash C will open an extra command prompt just to run this window. So if I double click that one, I'll get to where cmd.exe is stored. But what I wanted to do, okay, I'm here. Now I appear this, I see the string in text mode. And so if I, um, this is showing me in hex view, I want to go back to Ida view, and I will see it stored the way Ida stored it. Database, uh, data byte of bytes, cmd.exe slash c. And if I point over here, it will show me some of the code that runs it. And if I press Control X, it will show me all the code that uses it. And it turns out that that string is only used one place. So if I double click that, I will see the code that uses it. And here is how you can use IDA to figure out how code is used. And the simplest thing with all these complicated things is to read the stuff on the right. The stuff on the right in gray is the readable strings. So here I have two boxes, one runs CMD and the other runs command.exe. Up here, I call a, um, some Windows API calls to call get startup info and get system directory. So you can already guess what's going on here. Command is 16-bit Windows command processor and CMD is 32-bit processor. These are calling information about what the system directory is. So this is a bot command and control center. It is a bot that gives the user, uh, the bot master control of the machine. And when they issue a command, it then interrogates to decide whether it is a C system, system, Windows system 32 or a system folder, which tells you whether you've got Windows 98 or Windows XP, and it executes the correct command processor. That's what this is doing. And if you drag up and look at boxes up higher, you'll find readable strings sent to the controller. And here it is, high master. So it's printing a bunch of numbers. So this is the message sent to the controller. And if you click the high master, you'll see various strings that are used by it, showing mach machine uptime and encryption magic number for this remote shell session and so on. So these are the strings used to remotely control this machine uh, while it's in use by the bot master. And so then there are some challenges. And let me just go through the crack the one, two, one here, which is very easy to analyze in Ida Pro, and that's why it's here, of course. So I'm going to exit Ida Pro entirely just to get a clean start and not save the database. And I've already downloaded this thing onto this machine. Because I wrote this code a while ago when I really didn't know Visual Studio very well at all, I compiled it so you have to download a special build to run it. So there's two files you have to download. Um, Crack me and then msbcr100d.dil. If you put both of those in the same folder, you can run this software. If it's crack me, if you run it with no parameters, it tells you it needs a password. If you run it with a password, it tells you the password is wrong and you fail. And of course, the goal is to find the right password. So there are many ways to do it, including quite a few of the tools we used in this class. But to do it with IDA, you open it in your IDA. I've already opened it before. I'll just double click this and say OK. And it's going to ask me about whether I want to load debug information. In general, that would be good, but it didn't seem to work very well when I tried it. So I'm just going to say no. And so Ida opens up, as usual, to a stupid, useless place. It opens up a couple of useless panes on the left that I don't want. And instead of showing me any interesting code, it drops me in some stupid automatically generated Windows stub, which doesn't even point to any of the good stuff, so I feel abused. 
So as usual, I ignore their idea of how to find something, and I open strings. And strings is wonderful. Right at the top, it has fail, you found the password, and so on. So if I just double click fail, which is the message it showed me, now I go to the code that stores the word fail, and if I go to the cross reference and double click that, I can see the code that uses the word fail. So now I can find the password very easily. Here's an if statement, test something and jump not zero. So it either prints you found the password, congratulations, or fail. And up here it compares something to the string top secret. So right away I can see the right password is top secret. And if it matches that, it'll print I win. So that was really very easy. And I can test it by going back to my command prompt. So apparently the password is top secret. And it is, so I win. So, you know, there's it's that it can be that easy. And I learned I got these challenges. Um, I rewrote them from challenges that came from the um, uh, Honey Net Alliance, which had a bunch of European uh, malware analysts come and teach us classes down at Semantic. And some people complain greatly about the last one of these, uh, number four. These these actually point to different files, although I forgot to update the readable labels. Uh, number four induces some suffering. But anyway, you can analyze these things and get extra credit by figuring out how they work. And uh, I think that's all I had to tell you. Are there any questions about anything? Uh, so yes, we do have a, we do have one question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I download uh, I had a pro, I had a seven on a Windows 10 machine in the lab, and I tried to open uh, random bills on different parts of the machine. And I kept on getting prompted. I don't have administrative rights. Can you move in closer to the microphone? I can only hear a little of it. You put the IDA Pro 7 on Windows 10. And then IDA, what? IDA, on seven, uh, IDA 7 on Windows 10 yeah. on this machine. And then I couldn't open up random deals all over the, the host machine's uh, file directory. You kept on prompting me for you need administrator. Okay. Well, yeah, if you, if you want to open Dill libraries, you probably will need to run it as administrator. But if you open the Lab 0501 Dill um, that comes from, that we're analyzing here, you should be able to open that one because that's in user land. However, if you're running it on a normal Windows 10 machine, you'll probably have a lot of trouble from the antivirus. You'd probably be better off using a uh, Server 2016 Cloud Machine or the 2008 machine. Um, Let's see, somebody has a link. Click on T12.7Z. Um, I don't know what that is. That must be, uh, that's um, a question. Click on T12.7Z. Let me take a look. Perhaps there's a file missing. T12, is that at the end? There's T13, T12, and uh, it opens. So, Oh, it opens something called key 13. Oh, why, thank you. Um, okay, so apparently there's a problem with that. Let me make a note of this. Uh, it looks like uh, key 12 is missing. Okay, um, thank you for telling me. Key 12 goes to 13. I'll check into that. So anyway, um, I'm... That Windows 10 problem, I, I would say the simplest thing is use a Windows 2008 virtual machine. But anyway, the, um, now let's see, separate question for Project 221. Right, he asked that. Okay, I saw the question. I'll check that out. Good. Anyway, um, what deal were you trying to open on Windows 10? Okay, the deal. What deal? I don't remember. They're just a, a random deals that were not too large. In the C yeah. and program files, various ones. Yeah, if you if it's a real Windows system file, then you might need administrator privileges to open it, and you might have to run IDA as administrator to do it. Another thing you could do is make a copy of the deal on some place like your desktop. That might help. Anyway, any other questions? See nothing coming in on the chat. Can IDA interface with Linux? Uh, you can't run IDA on Linux, but you can disassemble Linux code in IDA. If you want to do similar work on Linux, the thing to use is Hopper. 
And uh, there's also, there's debuggers, but the main one I hear about is Hopper, although Didra should be a contender. And I think Didra in principle can run on anything, although uh, I haven't tried it on Linux, but it should run. Okay, can you spell that? Sure, Didra, G-A-D-R-A. Oh, yeah, it definitely runs on Linux, Sam. Good, yeah. So Didra is the new hotness, much nicer than Ida, and we'll talk about it next time. And here's somebody with a link to get red, red ASM. Ah, let's take a look at that. Red ASM, I've never used this. Is this fun? The open source disassembler. Not as spiffy as Ida. Well, I wouldn't expect so, but oh, it looks pretty good. Looks pretty close to Ida. Runs on Windows and Linux. Ooh. Well, that's interesting. I bet Gidra is better, but this slide is a good thing to know about. I'm going to add it to the links, at least the news or something, so I can find it again. Good. Good. This is good comments. Any other comments? All right, well, I guess I'm going to stop the share. I'll put up this video later, and I'm going to check into that uh, T12 file. I should be able to fix that one right away. Oh, it's monsoon season in Sri Lanka, so I'm glad I can. my conference is in the hotel. So it's going all right, but I'm appearing at a lot of events and uh, gets me tired. The, uh, they're making a very big deal about me here. There's a funny article I put in the news links is saying that I'm this super expert. and uh, it's a little strange, but anyway, it's uh, there's some pomp and circumstance in all these events out here, which I'm not used to. But there's a whole lot of very smart students. I went to their graduation ceremony or or a ceremony with high school students, and they were very smart and very interested in cybersecurity. And so I'm trying to get them to do Cyber Patriot over here, and uh, I'm hoping we can bring some more people over here and we can do that for them because I think that would really help them. And they have a lot of smart people graduating at all different levels. Uh, these people have brought me over here, run a training academy, and they, can, and they do pen tests and such. And they have a lot of people getting OSCP certification and everything. So anyway, I'm really glad to meet these people. It's the right group of people for me to talk to. Anyway, okay, is it freaking humid? Yes, very, <laughs> it is. It is very humid down here. It is a rainforest. So it rains pretty much all the time. And uh, it's also hot and muggy out there. So it's nice to stay inside. Oh, the food is very good. Uh, it's all Indian food. So vegetarians get real respect out here. I like that. <laughs> all right, I'm going to disconnect. I'll uh, see some of you tomorrow. And I'll hopefully be able to figure out the answer to that 127 question. Farewell. All right, that's the ending for all.